So <clears throat> thank you for the nice introduction. Welcome everybody to our talk. Unfortunately, Steve cannot be with us, but he will be with you for at least two video clips. And so first, and we will share the, the burden now. And first of all, I will talk a bit about the Institute and ourselves. So that's us. I'm a historian by training, but I'm working in the field what's now called digital humanities from for now already some 30 years, and I'm a scientific coordinator at the Institute. And Alexei is our applications developer, and uh, all, all the, most of the stuff we are showing to you is, is his work. And so that's where we are from. It's our part of our Institute, so it's very small, but it has a really long name, which is due to a compromise by the uh, structural committee which set up the institute in, in 2007 after formally it was uh, the Institute of History. That's why I'm still here. So that's our mission statement. So the institute is dedicated to the multidisciplinary uh, study of diversity in historical and contemporary societies, particularly concerning ethnic and religious forms and dynamics. So interdisciplinary is a, uh, is a base, is, is important thing. And so we, the institute was established almost 10 years ago in 2007, being formed the Institute for History, as I already said. Um, and at the moment, we have three departments, a newly found department for ethics, law, and politics, which is headed by Ayla Chahar, a lawyer, which, coming from the University of Toronto, the second department, Religious Diversity, headed by Peter van der Veer, um, and the part, department of Stephen Wertovec, Social Cultural Diversity, and what we are talking about are today are research projects coming from uh, this department and project we are working together with Steve on for already uh, four to five years. So that's, that's Stephen, he is from the US, was born in Chicago, did a study partly in Colorado in UCLA, and he was formerly at University of Oxford, and he is the founding director of the, this um, new institute for ethnic, ethnic and religious diversity in Göttingen from 2007. And now in another uh, mission statement, what uh, our work is in the department is about, it's about basically migration-driven diversity and related to other modes of increasing social, cultural, economic, and political differentiation. So that's the framework for what we are working uh, within. And one uh, important concept in this uh, framework is the concept of superdiversity, which was coined by Stephen Wertheberg in an article some 10 years ago, and uh, so this would be the first. The term superdiversity describes uh, a set of conditions or configurations arising from changing global migration patterns. And this includes the fact of uh, more people moving from more countries of origin. That includes more ethnicities, more religion, more uh, languages moving around the world. Um, it includes people moving under more complex conditions of legality or migration channels, so f family reunification, high and low-skilled migrants, asylum seekers, refugees, and the list goes on. And all of these things are marked also by changing patterns of gender and age, so that all these groups moving around are marked by different profiles like this. So that was a short description of the concept by Steve. So. And uh, what's impo one important issue is that this concept superdiversity was a very successful one over a lot of disciplines. I don't know if you're able to read this, probably it's too small, but it, it goes from sociology to geography, demography, so it's all, o all over the field, and this is uh, kind of a brutalization of a citation index uh, in, in different contexts. So the main point is that superdiversity is, is a really uh, successful uh, project which uh, an impact in different fields and uh, so and the one basic thing is that the whole stuff is migration driven and that's where our work comes in so we are uh, working on uh, diverse tools on visualization migration and diversity and the complex 
contexts. And now I would hand over to Alexei to give you a bit more details on that. Okay, so uh, most of the stuff we are doing while trying to visualize uh, super diversity is basically our so-called, as we call them, exploratory um, visualizations. So exploratory as opposed to, to a static narrative uh, you, would, you would have. And we try to, to give our um, visitors or our audience the uh, option to query data from uh, different angles, to modify queries, to, to get immediate feedback, and uh, also to, to be able to drill down on certain concepts. Uh, and uh, yeah, so basically all we try to do to keep all data manipulations uh, reversible so you can really explore the data on yourself and reinforce, we try to use this to reinforce basically the findings of, of the research. And uh, it also allows us to, to uh, mesh up and link also various sources and uh, incorporate them into, into our own work. Now, uh, in terms of um, visualizing super diversity, we have several projects uh, for, for that. So we have the so-called global migration database, uh, the international migration flows, uh, a migration heat map, which basically works also with the same data, but tries to, to uh, display it under a different angle. And we also did a project with um, the University of British Columbia visualizing the uh, landscapes of Vancouver. So we'll just have a brief uh, showcase of, of these different uh, visualizations. So um, the global migration uh, database is based on a a cooperation project with the World Bank and the aim of this project was to get an overview on worldwide migration country by country. So basically in technical perspective it's a 225 by 225 matrix which is based on that though that means we have 225 countries uh, related to 225 countries which uh, shows which people come from which country and go to which country. Uh, the databases are census data, so this um, database is only, uh, these data are only available for so-called census years, which are uh, mainly 19, in the 19, 1960, 1970, 1980, 2000, uh, because all this business is a bit slow, we are still working on the 2010 data, so the visualization only, at the moment only runs from 1960 to 2000, so we have five several uh, time slices, and uh, we have we tried to connect uh, the countries visually. And uh, Alexei will give you an uh, introduction how this now uh, works out and how you can use it because all the stuff we are showing you is online, so you can all access every, every all of these visualizers, almost every of these visualizers via our homepage. Okay, here we go. So the basic interface is a, is a world map where you can select countries. Should I go on? Let's do. Okay, so. Yeah, so we didn't test this exactly. Okay, so uh, you, the first step is you can select a country, and now the first country we are selecting uh, is the U.S. So, and you see it's, uh, so where is the piece? So it's 1960, and this is U.S. So, and you, the, the continents are marked by several colors. Every column represents one country. So what you basically see is uh, people, immigration to the U.S., or the, the state of immigration to the US in 1960. And you have a threshold slider where you can move up and down and so go into detail. And what you can see is most of immigration it comes from Europe and there is some from Asia and this is the Caribbean where we 
where we go. So, and the, so, so Nathan. Okay. So, so now you can s select several con separate countries, and Alexei is going to to go for the, go the most interesting at the moment. One of the most interesting things in the U.S. moment is immigration from Mexico. So you can mark Mexico, and then you can run the slider over time, and you see how immigration from Mexico is changing. And here you can see the. Here you can see the absolute figures, so it's 2,000, so it's still around 10 million. Now, they, now we are talking about 11 to 13 million immigrants from Mexico. Do, one shortcoming or one thing you have to keep in mind, this is legal migration. There are no illegals uh, in there because this is based on official census data. So that's the legal side of the business. Because for illegal data, you only have estimation, it's and it's difficult to, to include them in this. Um, if you select, you get... You, can, you get a heat map which shows where are the most important countries. And you see here Mexico is the country, the sending country with the, mo with the most immigrants to the US because it's the darkest color. So, okay, so the, and so what this uh, tool also allows for directly comparing countries. So now Alexei is going to select Germany. So you can directly compare Germany and the US, and if you move down the threshold, so what's, and what's important to this, you see kind of, yeah, fingerprints of immigration patterns. So you see for Germany, Europe is the most important area, um, that's, that's Asia, but the, much, more, much more immigration from Asia to the US. The Caribbean plays almost no role for Germany, of, it's because it's, it's obvious because it's of proximity issues, and what you have for Germany is this huge column. You may guess which country this is. Asia from Asia, it's Turkey. So that's Turkish immigrants to Germany. So and so and you can even add a third country, and then you get you have the possibility to compare migration pat immigration patterns for three different countries. Now this, the third one is Canada, which is more, more similar to Germany than, the U than, than to the US. And this is doable for all 225 countries or country-like uh, statehoods which are listed above. So you can compare almost every country with every country, or you can check the immigration patterns for every country. So and there is, on, there is an, an additional feature. So we, only, we, we also have the, the, the data for, by gender, so you can compare male and female immigration patterns for the selected, selected countries. So that's, uh, you know, the basic features of this visualizer we want to like to show you. But as I said, it's online on our website, so you are invited to explore it and check for the countries you are interested in. Then we would like to show you the second uh, visualizer, which we call inter International Migration Flows. This is based on a different set of data, which is OECD data, and it's only available for OECD countries. So um, it's not worldwide, it's only a smaller part of country, but the, the advantage of this set is... Can you Um um, uh, the, it's, it's only an, it's annual data, I mean, but you will find already familiar, pat familiar patterns. So we used the same color, color coding system. So you, um, okay, techniques always technique is always an issue. We have the same color coding system. So it's yellow. It's for Europe, and. Um, so, and you can select the country. We start with Germany. So, what you hear, and we used a different uh, form of visualization. So, uh, 
these data available, annual data available from 1970 onwards, and you can, can, can run it over. So, okay, you also have an automatic slider which shows you annual changes, and we, for demonstration purposes, we also selected Turkey, and you see the annual numbers of immigrants and immigrants, and if you look closely, we can see that the patterns are changing, so there are some years where more Turkish uh, persons are leaving Germany than coming to Germany, which is due to political uh, uh, regulations in the 19, late 1970s and 80s. So, and you can check this for every country. And so here you have the immigration, and on the outside you have the emigration. And you, so you can see how patterns are changing, and you can explore visually which are interesting cases, so which are interesting countries within Europe. And you also can see a pattern you already know from the previous visualizer. So the main immigration from and to in, concerning Germany is inner or European migration, as there are some from Asia and Africa coming later on, but basically it's 80% in a European migration, except the case of Turkey. But if Turkey is a European country, it's another discussion we don't want to have here. So, and this visualizer also allows for showing more than one country, so now we are comparing it to the US, and uh, for, you immediately recognize that there is an empty outer circle that's due to uh, U.S. Uh, regulations because the U.S. don't offer data for emigration. They only have immigration data but nothing for emigration. So the U.S. don't really know how many people are leaving their country. That's a different civil registration system we have in Germany and the U.S. And you can have up to four countries uh, in this visualizer and compare it. So, so we'll check, so we'll add the Netherlands and I think Canada, yes, to it. So, and you have, <clears throat> now you have four different countries and you can compare the, immigra the immigration pattern or the migration flow pattern for four countries at the same time. And if you read the slider run, you see, you see patterns and you see different patterns. So, and that's the aim. So it uh, somehow re relates to Dong's talk to make complex stuff. It's, the question is if it's easy to read, but at least to visualize it and to make uh, these kind of data available and to show colored patterns which represent fingerprints of immigration for, for a set of countries. That's the idea behind all these visualizers. Okay, so, and then we had, we did a second, a third try, and this is that, and this is the idea to have the global migration in one graph. So that's, that's basically the 225 by 225 matrix. So every point represents a, a migration from one country to another. And uh, the whole stuff is are ordered by continents, and uh, can, if you switch it on, so then you can see here this, the all, already familiar uh, color pattern. So you have, so we, here you have, that, that's Africa, which is highlighted, that's, uh, that's Asia, and oh, where it is, here it is, here we go. The, that's this block, for, now, this block, for instance, is Europe. And what you can see here uh, is that uh, the inner continental, the, continent, the migration within the continent is dominating. So you have the most traffic, to put it like that, is here within Europe or within Africa. And uh, so basically a country is a line, and if you, see a more, if you see something like an impressive line, that's one country. So I think that's... That's Germany here, and here down, that's the U.S. And what, you, what this graph shows, that Germany is an immigration country because it almost, uh, is almost as colorful as the U.S. So you can, you, 
so you can at least see this kind of patterns. Otherwise, it's, it's, it's a try to have uh, the global migration for one year in, or for one census year in one graph. So that's uh, the visualization stuff we did around all this, the, all this migration patterns based on trying to get to give the public another or the scientists another access to what Steve, to Stephen's concept of superdiversity. So that's the the background to that. So I think so, and then for something a little bit different. Um, that's a project we did uh, for Vancouver for one city only with uh, Dan Hebert, a colleague from the University of British Columbia, a geographer who collected a lot of data, uh, statistical data on Vancouver. And so we, uh, we worked on what we called super diverse landscapes of Vancouver. And so that's an, another small demo where you can see how migration works out in, in Vancouver and so some small problem with changing the screens. Okay. Okay, so so what you see here in the background is a, a city map, a map of the city of Vancouver, based on census tracts about 600, and we have very detailed uh, data on that. So that's very special for Canada, and we only want to show you. Uh, two phenomena you, you can select. So one thing would be, you may, if you know a bit about the discussion, the huge discussion about Chinese coming to Vancouver, the influx, the influx of Chinese and their impact on the housing market and so on and so on. So here you can check uh, by migration channel, by economic migration channels over time, um, how many people are people coming from China and how this change and where they settle in, in Vancouver. So if you go, if you, so, so you see there is more and more Chinese uh, coming over time and you can see also some movements within the city. This is one short example we would like to show you and the other one is um, a quite different one. It's about so-called caregivers, that's basically people uh, living in, uh, in households and taking care of elderly people and so on and so on. And they are come, so before 1971 there were no caregivers because of re legal regulations. And after, in the, in the following year, you see where they come from, mainly from the Philippines, and then how they more and more, more and more of these caregivers first from the Philippines and later on from more countries uh, coming to Vancouver and living in the city. So this is a tool for making this data for Vancouver available. So, and now we have to switch again. It's always a problem with live demos. There's a Okay, so um, that's a different approach. Uh, would we created holograms for the same kind of data? Maybe you going to talk more about that. Okay. 
So uh, basically, uh, the idea behind this visualization was, or, or the pitch for this visualization was that uh, our colleague, Dan Hebert, uh, he needed a 3D visualization uh, of, uh, of Vancouver. We had uh, some uh, high-density multivariate uh, data he needed uh, to, to have visualized. Um, Again, visualizing the different uh, migration channels, these social, economic, uh, religious, affiliation, immigration status, and uh, also place of birth. And we decided to combine this with uh, some data from LIDA and uh, from the nature, um, Natural Earth uh, Archive. And one important requirement was basically that this thing had to be uh, presentable offline, so it had to be presentable to, to policy makers uh, in situations where you would not always be able to, to bring up a, a digital interactive visualizer. We wanted it to be interactive nonetheless, so what we came up with basically was that we decided to create a holographic uh, display um, where you would use different holographic planes which would avail, uh, allow you to change the uh, data set based on the position you're looking from. So we have basically uh, an acrylic plate which is printed with an RGB laser and um, as you walk around uh, the, the plate you are able to see a um, geographical distribution of, of the values and you see different variables uh, or different categories. And so um, the, the whole thing looks like this. So if you, if you can see it, it basically as, as it rotates or as you go around it, it actually switches the, the landscape with the 3D objects. And uh, yeah, so you're actually able to explore uh, the whole data set without uh, any digital interactive means, uh, as you'd say. The most interesting thing about this visualization, though, is that we noticed afterward that if you have people standing uh, across the, the, the plate, and then one person would go, oh, look, this is really interesting, and then the other person, oh, yeah, I can see it, but they're actually talking about totally different uh, data points. So one thing we uh, noticed as we started using it, but yeah, nonetheless, I think this was kind of a first where you would use uh, this kind of visualization uh, and, and, and this medium. So. so now we are switching to the project Global Diversity. Um, uh, Ilya already mentioned in his introduction, I guess. And so, could you go to the next slide, I think? So, Global Diversity, it's a ERC Advanced Investigator Grant funded project for Stephen Berterwick. Um, it was a research team of sociologists, geographers, and anthropologists mainly. And so, uh, in the focus of this project, we had three mega cities with significantly different migration regimes. So it's New York, Johannesburg, and Singapore. And in New York, it's, we choose the neighborhood Astoria in Queens. So to introduce New York shortly in terms of migration, it's one of the migration capitals of the world. And it has, is, 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 uh, has a long experience of migration. It is positive, there's a basic positive uh, approach to migration. and. Uh, Astoria is one of the most diverse neighborhoods across ho the whole U.S. Uh, there's no dom dominant ethnic group, so in the, in the older times it was Greek and Italians and people from the Balkans which settled there. Now it's mainly people from the Caribbean and from Latin America living in, in Astoria. Uh, and these are the a map of the region and the, the, the red zones are the hotspots where our researchers did their work. That's because it's mainly public spaces and or streets and regions like that. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's okay. So and uh, the next uh, city we choose is Johannesburg and especially the, uh, the Hillborough in the inner city, which 
has a totally different history because until 1994 under the apartheid regime it was a main, absolutely white neighborhood, white middle class and after the end of apartheid 1994 it's totally changed. Nowadays Hillbrow is 98% black, it's a really poor uh, neighborhood and there is full of migrants and illegal migrant, migrants from sub-Saharan Africa which means for Zimbabwe or Nigeria or the Democratic Republic of Congo and these are the main research areas. That's Pretoria Street and a nearby market and this is Berea Park where our researchers uh, collected data. So it's mainly collect, uh, quantitative data which concentrates on on encounters of people. And the third uh, city with a different uh, migrant regime is Singapore. Singapore has a very strict regulated system. It's, it's based on the so-called CMIO uh, categories, Chinese, Malay, Indian, others. And almost everything is regulated in relation to the system, even housing. So if, you, if there is public housing, there, is a, there are rules that there, the uh, CMIO system is also represented in this housing. So you have no housing blocks which is totally Chinese or totally Malay, but always it should be mixed at least at the aim. And here we have a map of Singapore and also the red areas, which is a, uh, it's, it's a public train station and an uh, and a hawker center where you can get food of all different kinds. So, and uh, that's the research question for in public spaces across cities. What accounts for similarities, differences, differences in social and spatial patterns that arise under conditions of diversification when new diversity meets old diversity? That was uh, the question. And now, Steve. Uh, We'll give, uh, what we're interested in is the impacts of this kind of migrant diversification on local neighborhoods and particularly local urban spaces. How is diversification actually noticed in these places? What does it look like? How do people react to it? How do the spaces themselves affect the way that people encounter each other and, as it were, read different kinds of diversity? And what kinds of new practices and social interactions are uh, unraveling under these new conditions of migrant diversification. So now it's up to Alexei to tell you a bit what was our job within the Global Diversities Project. Yeah, so, so basically since uh, we had this interdisciplinary team uh, collecting uh, data, um, just in terms of the data collected uh, or by this ethnographic, by means of ethnographic observation, we had quite uh, diverse uh, sets of data. So we had field notes, we had video and photography, uh, historical data, we had interviews uh, with transcriptions thereof and uh, the so-called video elicitations, mental maps done by the participants of the research and uh, so-called transect walks where we we'll basically uh, record the geographical positions and the elicitations uh, of, of, of the um, location, which led to quite an arsenal of different data types. So we basically had photos, videos, and audio recordings, text documents, statistical data, maps, and, and so forth. And um, in terms of the data life cycle, we had to means to, to, to invent means to collect this kind of uh, qualitative data, uh, to store them, but I will mostly focus on the analysis and presentation uh, aspect of the data. Uh, so the visualization we tried to do had to be analytic. It had to enable uh, the researchers to actually uh, analyze and, uh, and, and, and work with the data and, and uh, sort of derive their findings based uh, on that. Uh, we wanted it to be, again, exploratory so that we would enable the audience of the researchers to uh, explore this data uh, on, and, and the findings on their own. And we did not want it to be limited to a single narrative. So that, I mean, with, with narrative visualization, you often have the idea of um, this kind of story you are presenting to be actually constructed by, by the researcher and we wanted to, to mitigate this uh, argument. And 
we wanted to capture uh, especially this uh, one focus of the of, of this project was to capture so-called fleeting encounters uh, which are happening all at the same time uh, we wanted to capture nuances of interpersonal communication which can be uh, quite easily lost if you um, start um, um, writing stuff down and um, so all these interactions are happening simultaneously uh, and we wanted to see how they are informed by the spatial context um, of, of the location. And another thing was that all the data we gathered had a set of metadata with it which we also wanted to be able to utilize so we wanted to to be able to extract geographical coordinates and based on those we can for example uh, infer the um, weather conditions or time of day or what events were happening in the vicinity and our researchers also were tagging all the data they collected with keywords so we wanted to extract those as well and to be able to present those uh, we came up with a system which we called the uh, data Rama. So basic concept is that we wanted to to be able to navigate data in its natural context and the natural context of this data is where it was gathered is, is basically a geographic location. So our researchers went to do field research in, a, in, in certain research areas and we wanted to be able to interactively explore uh, the relation between the sociological and geographical data in this location. Um, yeah, and another thing was that we also wanted to integrate uh, different kinds of data and to integrate real-time data sources, for example, stuff which is happening on Instagram, on Twitter, uh, at these locations, and also historical data. And this whole thing is packed in an immersive experience. Uh, and yeah, so to, to just foster, foster the discussion and collaboration between different disciplines. So what we basically came up with was that we wanted to create an immersive video projection which was interactive, which you could enter with a sizable audience and um, present your data uh, like in, in, in a way of a virtual location. So we re recruited a team of architects um, and uh, we had a custom designed uh, projection surface uh, but basically we are using off-the-shelf hardware for that. And this is the, uh, how this thing looks. So this is actually uh, was presented at the adjacent room uh, a year ago, I think. And um, yeah, we unfortunately were, were not able to, to bring it with us today because of the short uh, notice. Uh, but we, uh, we will present a short film about this, uh, this thing so you'd get an impression. We actually built it to be quite versatile. We wanted it to be able to show basically anything you would think of. Mm -hmm. And that's why we chose open standards, like uh, we wanted to have it as a web application built uh, just on, on the normal uh, standards of HTML and CSS. So basically anything you would be able to display on the web, mm -hmm. you can do in here.
every researcher who comes and visits uh, the Datarama, uh, almost instantly they get an idea of what I could do with this tool. And this is exactly what we wanted to do. So we wanted to build a tool which was not there before and, and to enable people to, to go out and think about new uh, different kinds of applications they might, uh, they might have and uh, they might be interested in exploring. Yeah, okay, so, yeah, basically the, the whole idea, I think you can see it, so it's, it's a interactive uh, virtual uh, environment. Uh, in terms of software, so we're doing video projection, mapping, uh, we are uh, merging uh, imagery on uh, using uh, multiple video projections, uh, video, video projectors, and in terms of interaction, we have lots of different possibilities, so you can use a touch interface, you have a gestural interface where you can basically grab into the data and pull it to you and zoom and, and explore locations, um, yeah, and you can also come in with your own mobile device and uh, interact with it in this way. Uh, yeah, and uh, just in, in terms of uh, what we uh, understood after using and trying this tool is that, uh, yeah, you can use technology uh, in data collection analysis to, to get new insights. Uh, one of the great benefits is that data once collected, in, indexed and stored can be used by other researchers in, in new ways you would, that the old team probably has not envisioned. And it's also a very important tool to, to be able to inform non-academics, policy makers. So, so uh, just connecting to, to the argument um, made previously about sort of giving back to, to the taxpayer or to, to the to the public to being able to uh, to communicate clearly what are your findings, what have you done with this research and, 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 and how it was done. I think it's, it's an important thing. And it also, uh, in this term, this, this tool has, adds another possibility of reasoning about space and, and, and data. And so on, on our roadmap, the next thing we will try to, uh, to add is 360 degree video. I think this would be very interesting. Real time communication. So we want to have a set of mobile clients where you would be able to send the field researchers out in the field and be able to use this tool to coordinate uh, the project, to co coordinate the research. So you'd be able to highlight certain parts or, or certain locations on the map and say like we need more on this or it would be interesting to, to drill down into that. You have a collaborative environment where people can actually discuss and, and uh, sort of talk about the data and, and, and change and annotate and uh, create their own uh, views on, 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 on the same um, data set. And we are also constantly looking for novel use cases, so uh, cooperation projects with other uh, institutes. And we had a couple of colleagues who visited the thing, and it was a really interesting because we had people from medicine informatics who were really interested because they could, at once, they could see the whole uh, protein molecule on, 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 on one display. It's like a feed which is quite difficult to achieve with multiple displays because you have to constantly zoom out, zoom in again, and so they're never able to see the whole thing in, in context. And also uh, corporations with uh, geology and archaeology, uh, being able to reconstruct spaces which are not available anymore, which do not exist, or which are probably too, uh, too dangerous to, to visit. And we're also thinking in, in, uh, in the direction of virtual reality and incorporating other platforms like Oculus Rift and, and other virtual uh, head-mounted displays. Yeah, so as I've already said, uh, presenting research to the public, MPI, MPI research is funded with taxpayer money, being able to give back to the public, quite an important thing and also to have a comprehensive tool set for analysis and visualization of quite a diverse uh, set of data. 
and making scientific complexity accessible through immersive audiovisual experience. So that's that's what we are basically looking at. And yeah, so I think that's uh, that would be it for the datorama. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions? Your data sets are t uh, pretty long in part, and starting 1970 and so on. And a lot of things change in that period, for example, nation, nation borders, like in Germany, the uni reunification, maybe the reporting standards change. How do you deal with those changes in the data structure by you know, uniting countries or splitting up countries or by changing the reporting standards? <clears throat> That's a huge problem for the data. Um, basically, we are relying with this data on previous work by, by a research team from the World Bank and other institutions. And the, the trick was basically to project everything within the current, de current frontiers and current boundaries. Otherwise, you have a huge amount of caveats. And to be fair, uh, <clears throat> to say that's kind of a first attempt. So the idea is to have, at the first time, to have all this worldwide data together and have this, to have these patterns. And in detail, there's a lot of work to do and to get better data and to build a version to zero or something like that. But it's a huge problem and it's, it's difficult if you put it together into one visualization system to have all these uh, aspects represented. Because you have lots of texts and caveats, what's changed and how, uh, yes, how the criteria for counting and so on, and so on change on, changed over time. So, so basically, the ba <clears throat> my argument mostly is we, you have get an impression <clears throat> and you see basic patterns. And starting on that, you have to drill deeper into the data and look. Yeah, and, uh... And, and one another aspect is also that all lots of countries have pretty different reporting standards. So uh, who who is a foreigner basically? Yeah. So so it's it's something to to work around with with clever um, calculations and or disclaimers depending on your on your situation. I, uh, it was quite interesting to note that uh, medical informatics people do use this data to kind of uh, deal with several things. But I was also wondering.